So session number six, we looking at guarding the heart. Uh, we do session number six on the same. We began talking about two kinds of heart, and uh, I want to talk about a good heart briefly today, as we talk the two kinds of heart: a good heart and an evil heart, as is outlined in the scriptures. And as we do that today, I I want to a little bit focus more on the good heart. Amen. Amen. Now, biblically speaking, and I think we introduced this last week, biblically speaking, and according to kingdom standards, and I say this because, I say this because, we have all thoughts and all notions about what a good heart is. We have all kinds of notions and things. But after all is said and done, we have to come back to the Bible. Amen. Amen. That is where it that's where, that's the standard. We have to come back to the Bible to understand the nexus between our position and our assignment, to understand that, that nexus. It's good to have a clear understanding of each independently, what is our position and what is our assignment. Now to understand our position, we have to understand the new birth, right? New birth. And I said, for us to understand new birth, we have to go back to the Bible and allow the Bible to define the new birth to us and not what religion has defined new birth as. Because new birth has nothing to do with uh, sin, confessing sin. That's what we think. That's what we believe. That's what we say. But new birth has got to do with the believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ and confessing the Lordship. Of Jesus. So what we confess is not sin. What we confess is the Lordship of Jesus. You get my point? So we have to go back to the Bible. And you see, if that is put in proper perspective, some of these difficulties we have, we will not have. That's why I'm saying a good heart, biblically speaking, and according to kingdom standards, a good heart is a Christ-centered heart. We begin there. A good heart is a Christ-centered heart. It's a heart that has a living and active relationship with God. We cannot begin talking about a good heart without having a good relationship with God. A good heart begins with a good relationship with God. Are we together? You have to come to the place where you go back to the one who is the owner of the heart. Let me ask a question. Let me ask that question. Where do you get a good fish from? Yeah? Where do you get a good fish from? Does the quality of water determine the quality of fish? Yes. So we are, we are in agreement. So good fish comes from some good water. So you have to go back to the source. Isn't it? You have to go back to the source. So if we talk about a good heart, we cannot talk of a good heart on the basis or on the standards of your traditions, or your tribe, or your culture, or your customs. We have to go back to God. All right? Right back to God. So it's a heart, a good heart is a heart that has a living and active relationship with God. A good heart is one that has been transformed by God and is aligned with his character and purposes. Now let me say this. Even in the natural, when we are talking about a good heart, we are talking about character. Talk to me somebody. Yeah. When he says so and so has a good heart, what are we talking about? Their character. So when you talk about good heart, we are talking about character. Now if a good heart has got to do with us going back to God, then we are going back to God's character. So it's a heart that is aligned whose character is aligned to God's character. Now that therefore means, brothers and sisters, it's impossible to have a good heart if you don't know God. Because how do you know his character if you don't know him? You cannot know one if you don't know, you cannot know one's character if you don't know them, isn't it? You see, most of you will meet here on Sunday and uh, you will, you will come and you see, you will listen to me preach or pray or do this kind of stuff. And you think you know me? You don't. 
You don't. You have to find me at home. Talk to me. You have to find me at home. By the way, you don't know a person until you've interacted with them in a few ways. At the level of home, talk to me somebody. Yeah. Interact with them at the level of money. Mm -hmm. If you have not interacted with somebody at the level of money, you don't know them. You don't know them. You've got to know how they handle money. What is their relationship with money? What is their attitude towards money? Are we together? How convincing are they when borrowing you? And how easy is it for them to refund? Now you begin to know the person you're dealing with. Money. What influence does money have on them? How do they behave when they have money? And when they are broke? Of course, when they are broke, they are holier. Yeah? You see those kind of things? Yeah. So you have to know the person in very particular ways that you get to establish the character of the man. Similarly, you have to know God and walk with God so that you are familiar with the character of God and then your heart is aligned towards that character. But your generosity now is not because your great-grandfather was generous or philanthropic, but your generosity is anchored on God. Are we together? That the heart of your heavenly father is a generous heart. While that man is generous, they have an agenda behind generosity. While you are generous, you have no agenda behind your generosity. You are simply generous because that's your nature. The heart is aligned to God's character. Your patience. Do you know how patient God is? Let me explain to you or define how patient God is. The patience of God can simply be seen and known by you with simple definition of this you are alive today he hasn't he has not destroyed you and you know yourself you do know very well that if someone treated you the way you treat god you know very well ah, you know what you'd have done with them talk to me somebody the fact that you're alive today that god has not consumed you has not swept you off, has not wiped you off, is a definition of the patience of God. So that if someone asks you, how patient is God? This, this much, that I'm alive today. Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever thought like you wish you were God and deal with that person? Yes. <laughs> Never wish that again. Because if you were God, you would do what God does. Because you would be God. And God can only do what God does because he's God. Talk to me. Right? So you have to know him. That you're no longer patient. That your patience, listen. That your patience is not because of something you benefit. Because of patience. But your patience is simply because it has become your nature. The patience of God is anchored on his nature. God is not patient with you for his benefit. God is patient with you for your benefit. God loves you for your benefit. He didn't save you for his benefit. God was not lonely. Talk to me. Those of you who believe in the gospel that Satan was kicked from heaven and he was the worship leader and so there was a vacancy in heaven and God now saves us to fill that vacancy. That's a lie. That's not biblical. It's a lie. There's no vacancy I'm feeling. God simply loved you. He gave his son that you can be reconciled back to him because he loves you. Praise the name of the Lord. He was not seeking for something from you. He was seeking you to benefit from his love. He has so much love. He wants someone to benefit. That someone is man. He created everything, heaven and earth. He made everything. He decides this that I've made, read chapter 1 of Genesis, is good. Everything is good. Animals, good. Fish, good. 
Oceans, good. Trees, good. Everything was good. And he decides, I want a son for two reasons. One, to enjoy this good that I've created and to represent me in this earth and manage the good. Why? For his own benefit, the son. We're together. So a good heart, ladies and gentlemen, is one that is free from selfish agenda. It has been aligned to the character of God. That's a tall order, don't you think so? Tall order. But guess what? It's doable. It's achievable in Christ. Where you come to a point where you do people good. I mean, someone asked me, I think it was my son was asking me, how are you able to go again and do someone good while people have hurt you? I told him, I just can't afford not to. Because you see, if God stopped doing you good because someone else hurt him, we all will be in trouble. We all. Because you have no idea how many people have failed God here in different ways. We all would be in trouble. Today. So God does not treat you as you deserve. But really, he treats you based on his love. A good heart is one that has aligned itself to this kind of character. That you learn to treat people not as they deserve. Because listen, most of your friends, let me go cut closer, even your brothers and sisters, if you are to treat them as they deserve, talk to me. So a good heart has been transformed by God and is aligned to his character. Are we together? And his purposes. That whatever you do, you are motivated by love. Your patience is out of love. A generosity is out of love. Yeah? Your kindness is out of love. Now, if you want to have a simple understanding of uh, the character of God, you just look at the fruit of the spirit. If you can put that up somewhere. Galatians 5, I think. Okay? Is it 22? Let's have that. That's where you get the character of God. A heart, a good heart is this. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness. Now, long-suffering does not mean suffering for long. It's kind of, it's love, joy, peace, and patience. It's patience. All right? Let's get an IV. I, I don't want somebody to go here and say, I've been suffering for the last 15 years. These are no, 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 no. The long suffering is, is not what? It's not suffering for long. Eh? Joy. Okay. We have which version is that now? The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness. You see that? That's what we're talking about. Just goodness. Goodness. Developing a stature of goodness. Character that is just, you have a goodness within you. We're together. You, you have no malice. as a good heart. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is not a one-off thing. It's a character. Gentleness. And what? self-control. That's the character of God. What you talk about, the fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ. Then the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the power of Christ. Okay? So, a good heart is that heart that has been aligned to the character of God. It's a heart that reflects the love of Christ, the humility of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, the obedience of Christ. It's a good heart. It is a heart that has the integrity of Christ. Now, I said this last Sunday, that a good heart is one that is marinated in the nature of Christ. We're together. It's a heart marinated in the nature of Christ. It's been soaked in and absorbs Christ's nature. Look at Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed 
to the image of his son to be conformed that he might be the firstborn among many greek word is n that word among in greek is en n meaning in many okay the word conformed is sumorphos sumorphos which talks of similar similar to it is be fashion it's having the same form as the same image as so we are being formed together okay so so a good heart is a heart that is conforming to Christ that is what we call a good heart from a biblical point of view secondly number 2 a good heart is cultured and governed by the word of god a good heart is cultured and governed by the word of god cultured refined molded shaped and governed by the word of god one cannot talk of having a good heart when they are ignorant of god's word remember we have said that a good heart is christ like heart christ centered heart is a heart that has a living and active relationship with god where do you find god god has hidden himself in the word we together that's where you find him When he says seek me and you'll find me, he is not saying you go to Catalonia for heaven's sake. Talk to me. He's not saying you go to Catalonia. And I know we did all those things when you you're going to this or that prayer center. What are you going to do? I'm going to seek God. There's a Greek word called komaga. Hmm? Hmm? That's a, that that Greek word there, komada odio, wa Jehovah. You know, it's a, it's a Greek phrase that simply means to seek the face of Jehovah. Jehovah's face is not in Catalonia. Are we together? And those of you who possibly will go and sleep out in the desert somewhere, in the wilderness somewhere, Jehovah's face is not in the there's that wilderness god is not a bushman i have told you again and again god is not a bushman so he he doesn't stay in bushes so he says that you seek the lord and then you got the bush to seek the lord he will not you will not find him in the bush god has hidden himself in the word seek him and you'll find him where in the word a man knows god to the extent he knows the word you get the point a man knows god to which extent the extent he knows the word now listen to me knowledge of the word here is not memorizing verses because again we think that knowledge of the word is memorizing verses some ones have more verses than others Listen, when you read the word, the verse you memorize is not what changes your life, but the meaning. The meaning of that verse. What does it mean? That's when you understand the word, the meaning of it. How many of us know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. That's all. That's one of the most profound scriptures. But you understand its meaning? very few the lord is my shepherd i shall not want but do you understand the meaning of that so they told us the wrong thing in stand in sunday school to memorize it's okay to memorize these verses it's good to memorize the word of god but beyond the memorizing of the word of god please get to know the meaning what is the importance of memorizing the word of god because as you memorize you help your mind the word renews your mind the word programs your mind the word shapes your mind that's why it is important to memorize the word of god but come to a place and go a step beyond memorizing which is what understanding that's where you begin to find god the ways of god are hidden in the word of god We used to sing a song, "Ne, Gwenda ma, 
Godiaga Najera Shakwanga. I would really want to walk in the ways of the Lord. The ways of the Lord are hidden in the word of God. Amen? Amen. And so, if you want to be a man or a woman who has a good heart, you've got to be a man of the word. Go back to the word. Read the word. Study the word. Find its meaning. Amen? Listen to the word of God. Listen. I want to tell you why it is very critical to listen. I encourage the reading of the word of God. You hear me? The reading. But I also encourage the listening of the word. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing. not by reading. But by hearing. Listen to the word of God. Even as you read, listen. Hear as you read. Are we together? Yes. As you read, listen and hear. And then deliberately listen to the word. Listen. These things we record here, we don't record just for purposes of recording. But so that you can listen and build your faith. A good heart is both receptive and trembles at the word of God. And that's how you measure your heart. How does your heart receive the word? Does your heart tremble at the word of God? Now listen. Trembling at the word of God does not mean when the preaching is going on, you are shaking. No, no, no. no. But your heart breaks and yields and commits to do that word. Are you together? You tremble at the word of God. At the thought of not doing that word, you can't imagine. You, there is an awe in your spirit as you receive the word of God. A good heart is a good ground upon which the word grows. Remember the seed that fell among the thorns, among the stones, on the sideways, and one fell on the good ground. That is the heart. It says in Luke chapter 8 verse 15, Luke 8 15. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, they keep it and bear fruit with patience. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Having heard the word with what? With a noble heart. They keep that word. You have to know the word of God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Look at Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, Heaven, Heaven, Heaven is my throne. Just that alone there should make you begin to think and understand something about heaven. Heaven is my throne. Alright? It's where God rules from. Let me not go to there. And earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you'll build me? Look at the question God is asking. Where is the house that you'll build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. When I read this verse here, just pause a bit. My hand has made. I thought God made a mistake. Or the writers. I thought they should have said my hands. God, just one hand. He has yacht. Just one hand. How much can one of your hands accomplish? For all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist. Says the Lord. The hand is a picture of the power. He says, I made them by my power. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. See that? This one I'm going to look at. In other words, 
The house, if you build me a house or give me a place, all those things you do, they don't impress me. But there's one I'm going to look at. There's one I will take attention. There's one I take note of. One person impresses me. Hallelujah. One person catches my attention. One person I look at, the one who is poor, hungry, fasting. Right? We're together. Hungry, fasting. And the heart is contrite. A poor and a contrite spirit. And who trembles at my word. That word, contrite, is a very interesting word. Because in, in, in uh, Bible language, in Hebrew language, it doesn't just mean, uh, how do I explain it? It doesn't just mean humble or meek or whatever. But it's actually, the, the Hebrew word means crushed. A crushed heart. It's so crushed. So crushed. Nothing of self is there. It is completely crushed. It says, that heart I look at. Amen. A good heart, my brothers and sisters, is governed by the word. Now listen, why does it become a good heart when governed by the word? Because it inclines towards God's will. God's will is in the word. Let me help you today. We have this uh, phrase we always say, I want to know the will of God. I don't want to do this if it is not the will of God. If you increase your knowledge of the word, it will be very easy to discern God's will. Because whatever God does is consistent with his word. And you'll be able to know the will of God. Amen? Yeah. So do I marry this girl or not? Take her. Put her on one side. Put the one on the other side. See what happens. That's all. Measure her against the word. Measure him against the word. Talk to me. Yeah. There's a way that when you are in, increase in the knowledge of the word of God, listen to me, the word forms a government in you. That when something is presented to you and it is contrary to God's will at the moment, the government within rejects it. You can't explain how it works. But it is simply works because you have established a government from within you. That government is the word of God. Can I hear an amen? amen? It's a government by the word of God. The word becomes an internal, self-regulating government in your heart. That's how your heart gets aligned to God's will. That's how your heart gets aligned, gets aligned to God's purposes. That is how your heart becomes a good heart. And that's how your heart becomes nurtured. That's how the heart is marinated in the nature of Christ. When you become a man of the word. Hallelujah. Yeah. Seek to understand what does that verse mean and apply that in your life. What does this mean? Apply that in your life. Make it practical in your own life. Amen. That's how Jesus lived. Listen to me. The way you interact with the word of God, that is, how you assess it, three things are very important. How you assess it, how you judge it, how you act on it. The way you interact with the word of God, your assessment of that word, your judgment concerning that word, and the action of that, on that word. Depends on the state of your heart. The heart is very critical. It matters the word. Amen? Amen. Let me show you something as we do pick up the last one and close. Just, just to show how what you're talking about when, you, when, you, when your heart is broken and you have determined I'm going to obey God. Follow me in Luke chapter 5. Just a simple story there. Luke chapter 5. And we, we look at verse uh, 1 to 6. Let me show you something here. A heart governed by the word. Eh? So it was. Are you there? Yes. So it was. As the multitude pressed about him to clear the word of God. 
that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little to put out a little from the land. Now, pause. Just pause. Um, there are many boats. Are they there? Yes. Can you see them? Then he got into one of the boats, meaning there are many. Okay? There are two boats actually. Verse 2, there are two boats. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. Study that the meaning of that word Simon is one who hears intelligently. Simon, meaning one who hears intelligently. So he got into the boat of the one who hears intelligently. To hear intelligently is to hear with an intention to do. Are we together? So he got into the boat of one who will hear and do. Not just hear, but hear and do. He got into Simon's boat. And he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, remember Simon, one who hears intelligently. He said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. Let down your nets. What time is this? It must be now in the morning during the day. This is not at night. Now, I know, I know most of you, you know, have no idea about fishing. You don't fish in the morning. They fish at night. Are we together? And so Simon answers, verse 5. But Simon answered and said to him, Master. He even knows his master. Master, we have toiled how long? All All night and caught nothing. Read the next one. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the name. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. Now, this man has been a fisherman all his life. All right? You do have to know that Peter had a wife. So he probably had children. We don't know. Because the Bible talks about at some point Jesus going with him to Peter's mother in law. Yeah. Meaning there was a law. Isn't it? Yes. Oh, no, why did you laugh? That, that's how it goes. Isn't it? Yeah. If you have mother-in-law, that means there is a law. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And who is the law? The wife. The wife. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so there was, a, there was a wife. So Simon has raised up this family through Fishing. That's his experience. He knows it. He knows it. He knows it. I, I cannot be so sure, but I suspect they probably were around the same age mate with Jesus. And so he knows that this man was never a fisherman. Because I would have known him. Jews were following the traditions and the professions of their parents. So this man was definitely not a fisherman. He doesn't know nothing about fishing. I know. And I've done, I've put my experience to task the whole night and caught nothing. But though he's not a fisherman, there's one thing I know of him, he's a master. He owns both the sea and the fish. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He owns, listen to me, he owns both the fish and the sea. He owns the time. The day belongs to him and the night belongs to him. Oh, praise God. So he's master. So he's master by the night, master by the day, master of a time, master by the sea, master of a fish. He is master. He says, nevertheless, master, at your word. At your word. What you just said contradicts my experience. It does not make logical sense to me. That's what I simply say. 
I'll tell you this, brothers and sisters. Faith is not logical. Faith is beyond logic. We're together. It's beyond logic. Faith is anchored on the revelation of the one who is saying. Faith is you responding to God's word. But that faith is anchored not on just the word spoken, but on the faith, the confidence of the one who has spoken it. That he watches over that word to fulfill it. Amen? Amen. That's faith. And so, he begins by saying, Master. Master. Because he wants to draw his attention, Master, for us, our experience has failed. Our efforts have failed. Come on, talk to me. Yeah. Our labor has not borne any fruit. Yeah. Master, we have done our best. We have done our best. And we caught nothing. But we come under your word. Praise the name of the living God. We submit ourselves to your word. We come under your word. At your word, I will let down the net. Now, he did not just say, I will let down the net. He let down the net. Most of us finish at that point. At your word, Lord, I will let down the net. Oh, God, I will just do as you say. As you say. But it ends there. It ends with the promise. Listen, God is the one who has given us promises. You are not called to give him promises. Desist from that culture from today. Don't give him promises. Do what he says. Amen? Amen. And so he lets down the net. He lets down? That's a heart that is governed by the word. There is a government within me that is bigger and greater than my logic. What the, the word spoken to me does not make sense. But I also know this word has inherent power that is beyond my comprehension. The power in this word is based on the master who spoke the word. Hallelujah. Now, if you go down here, the two of us, and I tell you, there is a, a vehicle coming, I tell you, stand on the road as it comes and just wave your hand. It will stop. It's a lorry trailer coming. Trailer. 28 wheeler. I said, just stand. Step in, step in quickly. Step, step, step. And how many of you will do that? If you have a police officer, traffic police officer, fully uniformed, and they tell you, stand there and wave, will you? Yes. Why? But do, don't, I'm the man of God. I'm born again, Holy Ghost filled. The one driving does not know that. <laughs> So do you know why you have faith in this word? Because you know the one who has spoken. And you know the one I'm stopping knows the one who has spoken. And can see the one who has spoken. The one driving knows the authority of one who has spoken. I also know the one, I mean the authority of one who has spoken. Based on the position of the speaker, I obey. And he stops. We're together. Because you know that they have the power to stop them. This man is saying, Master, hallelujah, I know the fish can hear you and come. Master, I know, I know, I know. You're the master of the night and the day. You can do during the day what you can do during the night. Glory to God. That's a good heart. A heart. That trembles at the word. Do you think it is easy for Peter? All the other fishermen are looking at him. Wait, wait. Are we checking? What is going on here? Wait. Check. 
Nathaniel, what's, what's going on with Peter? Peter has lost it. I know we, the night was so dry, Peter has lost it. Wait, John, John, look at Peter, look at Peter. You think it was easy? Peter knows that they are looking at him. Peter knows they can't understand him. Peter knows that what he's doing contradicts the profession. But there is a word spoken to him. Hallelujah. And he has allowed the word to govern his heart. And he has faith that he who has spoken will bring it to pass. I dare you to believe God's word and see what God will do in your life. Dare believe his word and see. He's trembling at the word. There's a conflict with him, but he does it. Just obey. That's a good heart. A good heart is governed by the word. It obeys the heart. The word. It follows the word. And lastly, a good heart is a heart led by the Holy Spirit. A good heart is led by? Now listen to me. The Holy Spirit works where the word is. The environment within which the Holy Spirit works is the environment of the word. Where there is no word, the Holy Spirit does not work there. So do you now see the connection of all these things that we just talked today? That a heart that is Christ-centered, governed by the word, led by the Holy Spirit. When you come to Christ, then give yourself to the word of God. Submit the word of God and let the Holy Spirit lead you. The Holy Spirit leads you according to the word. The Holy Spirit does not contradict the word. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you today, Ivan, as you conclude, submit yourself to the word of God, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, and listen, and listen. If you want to be led by the Holy Spirit, because listen, the Holy Spirit works where the word is. Secondly, the Holy Spirit works where authority is honored. Come on, say after me. The Holy Spirit, Spirit. works where authority is honored. honored. Avoid telling someone who is leading you, God told me. Because what you've just done is shut off leadership. They can't lead you because God told you. Because God is ultimate. You want to be led? Avoid that statement. Because it's very subjective. You get the point? It's very subjective. Or are you saying, I'm thinking? Because your thinking can be challenged. So follow Christ, love him, follow his word, submit to his word, and yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, and you become the kind of a man that God wants you to be. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up on our feet.